1996, a Brazilian heavy metal band released a phenomenal record called Roots. It would also be the last album to feature Max Cavalera, a founding member of the group. At the time, the term groove metal had become synonymous with none other than Pantera, who by this point in their career had already pushed the genre into the spotlight with Cowboys From Hell, Vulgar Display of Power, and Far Beyond Driven. Roots, however, was much more than just a groove metal album. It took influence from traditional Brazilian culture and heritage featuring the enigmatic voices of an indigenous Brazilian tribe. A tribe, one of many, that were facing the end of their culture due to aggressive governmental policies, something Max Cavalera had to speak out about. Ross Robinson would be at the helm for the recording of this beast, often cited as the godfather of new metal, having produced debut albums for Korn and Deftones in 1994 and 1995 respectively. He also went on to produce for Limp Bizkit, Machine Head and Slipknot, along with Soulfly in 1998. Along the way, there has been chaos, death and addiction. Relationships have been made and crushed. The truth about Sepultura, my beloved first band, and why I left it has not fully been revealed before now. And nor has the truth about my struggle with alcohol and painkillers. It's time to set the record straight. At a time when underground music was exactly that, underground, there was no viral internet promotion, this band of Brazilian brothers somehow managed to break through into the western metal scene and dominate music charts across Europe and America. This truly unique outfit were the first metal act to come out of Brazil and achieve international success with this style of music 40 years ago something no other band from the country has been able to replicate since. Their road to riches, however, was not paved in gold. This is Roots, Bloody Roots, the story of Brazil's biggest heavy metal export, Sepultura. Born Massimiliano Cavalera in Belo Horizonte, Brazil, August the 4th, 1969, or just Max to you and I. Although Max wasn't raised here, he was raised in Sao Paulo. It just so happened that his mother's family was from this area, so she took an eight hour bus ride to give birth to him here. A year later, a brother would be born on September the 4th, 1970 in the same place, Belo Horizonte. That brother would be Igor Cavalera. Their father, Graziano Cavalera, of Italian descent, worked at the Italian embassy in Sao Paulo. Their mother, Vania, was a model. They both met after Graziano moved from Italy to Brazil. We had a huge Italian family. Every Sunday, we had a big meal and all the family got together, 20 or 30 of us around a huge table. Fights would break out between cousins. One time, an uncle of mine threw a plate and it ended up hitting one of my cousins in the forehead. He fell to the floor, knocked out, with blood all over his face. He had to get stitches. That was a typical Sunday dinner for us. Max says he had a very special bond with his father, developed through a love of football. His father would take him to the football stadium religiously more than once a week. Music was also a passion of his father's. He had amassed over 3,000 vinyl records, mostly Italian classical music and opera. Music Max and Igor would listen to often when they were young. Overall, Max and Igor had a relatively stable and supportive upbringing. They were also placed in a conservative Catholic school in Sao Paulo run by nuns. They were both grade A students. We didn't fuck around, we worked hard. I really liked history and I was always really curious about historical fact. I wasn't so good at math, but I got through okay. We played soccer a lot with the other kids in the neighborhood. There was a little field where you could play five-a-side indoor soccer. 
we grew up playing that game. Unfortunately, when Max and Igor were around five and six years old, their newly born sister, Carissa, would not enjoy the same start in life. She was born with an untreatable disease and died after just one month. Kira, however, their second sister born one year later, did not suffer the same tragic fate. Max almost lost his life at a young age also. He contracted meningitis at the age of eight, and if his dad had waited just one more day to take him to the hospital, doctors said he wouldn't have made it. He was in hospital for an entire week. This though was almost the only struggle Max faced, in his childhood at least. It was a dream childhood. My dad never fought with my mum, not even once. They hardly ever argued. Maybe a little bit at most. He didn't drink and there was never any abuse in the family. Compared to what I saw later when I travelled the world, I had a really different childhood to most people. Sadly for Max and Igor, their loving father, who they cared so deeply for, lost his life on September the 22nd, 1979. He had been taken to hospital with severe chest pains. A suspected heart attack was the cause of his death. It was a total shock. Life just changed 360 degrees. It was the most confusing thing ever, and I was 10 years old. I had to deal with the funeral. I went to kiss him and his face was cold. For a long time I had a hard time to be around roses, because the whole room was full of them at the funeral. The smell of them has stayed with me forever. Even today I get freaked out if I smell them. I can't be near them, because it takes me right back to that moment. Not only was this devastating for both Max and Igor, it left their family in financial ruin. This seemed to be the trauma that would change their lives forever. They started to struggle in school, their grades dropped, and they were even kicked out of two schools. They were also told by their mother they would have to get jobs, as the family had no money. Max and Igor were only 11 and 10 years old. They got jobs in a hat factory, then an ice cream parlor, and then a shoe factory. This is where the pair would start to sniff glue, as they had to work with gallons of the stuff and all of the other workers got high doing it, mainly because they all hated the job. This wasn't just the loss of their father, this was the loss of their life as they knew it. This is where Max Cavalera turned against God and his religious upbringing. He couldn't understand why God would do such a thing to him and his family. This was the catalyst that gave birth to the anarchy and anti-religious nature of what would become Sepultura. Sepultura by default became an outlet for Max and Igor to rebel against religion and the church, and music became their salvation. After moving back to Belo Horizonte, due to their father's death, they saw friends getting into crime and drugs a path they could have easily followed after their recent trauma. After the death of their father, Max decided to start looking through his vinyl collection, looking for an escape, a way to deal with the pain he felt deeply within his soul, and he found it. I was so pissed off, a music came and took over, speaking directly to my soul. I went into his vinyl collection to see what he listened to, and I actually found Led Zeppelin IV and Black Sabbath's first album. It was amazing. He never played them to us, but he had them. Max was more into soccer as opposed to music at this point in his life. His first real experience with music was when his cousin took him an eagle to see Queen in 1981. He would have been around 11 years old. The very next morning, Max and Igor went to the record store to buy some music. Soccer seemed to be put in the back seat. Their cousin let them each buy a cassette album. Max bought Queen, Live Killers, a live album released in 1979. Don't take it away. And Igor purchased Kiss, Alive 2, released in 1977. Listen to those tapes over and over and over. I knew those two albums by heart. I'd heard no music before that, only a little bit of Brazilian music from the radio. Queen changed all of that. 
the concert was a major turning point in our lives. This became quite a confusing time for both Max and Igor. They had discovered the power of rock and roll, started to grow their hair long and wanted to explore music. Their mother and family had other plans though. They were both getting into the usual teenage trouble of local graffiti and stealing human skulls from the local cemetery. Okay, well, almost the usual teenage trouble. They ended up in a military school, which may seem like a place to straighten up your kids, but it seemed military school came as quite a shock to both of the Cavalera brothers. We were there for about three years. It was brutal. I had a teacher who used to come to the class every day, and the first thing she did was take a fucking 38 revolver out of her purse and put it on the table. That was her way of saying, don't fuck with me. She would wave it around while she was teaching. This experience only pushed Max further into rebellion. He said it made him hate the police, hate the abuse of power, and also exposed him to police brutality. Max and his brother were eventually kicked out of military school. Their cousin, thinking this would somehow put Max on the right path, then tried to basically bribe him into getting his hair cut but it backfired big time. My cousin who took us to see Queen was trying to get me and Igor on the right path. We had long hair and he said if I got it cut off, he would buy any record I wanted. I agreed and went to the barber to get my hair cut because I knew it would grow back again. I asked him to buy me Metallica's Ride the Lightning. Ride the Lightning was in 1984. This wasn't the first metal record that Max had showed an interest in. He and Igor were already listening to the likes of Venom, Motorhead, Black Sabbath, and Iron Maiden. Max would spend hours trying to learn English from the records of these bands. And this is where the name for Sepultura actually came from. I was learning some English from translating the text on vinyl albums. I had learned a bit in school, but honestly, most of it came from LPs. I'd spend a whole night translating Iron Maiden, Black Sabbath, and Motorhead lyrics. On the Motorhead album Another Perfect Day, there was a song called Dancing on Your Grave, and when you translate grave into Portuguese, it becomes Sepultura. I thought that would be a cool name, so I drew the logo in a book, which is now in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. This growing obsession with music would eventually lead Max to picking up the guitar, so he saved up some money and bought his first electric, with an amp and a pedal. He never took lessons, he just learned to play by ear, and the first song he ever learned to play, with the help of a friend, was Heaven and Hell by Black Sabbath. <laughs> He would also play A Whole Lot of Rosie by ACDC and of course Smoke on the Water by Deep Purple, a rite of passage for any would-be metal musician. Before they knew it, Max and Igor were playing in a band. It was me on guitar, Igor on drums, Wagner on vocals and a guy called Rob on bass. Rob was a friend of ours, the son of a Canadian priest from the Baptist church or another of those religions. He had an amplifier and we could plug our shit into it. That was the beginning of Sepultura, back in 1983. One year later, in 1984, Sepultura would play their very first show. In December of 1984, Sepultura played their first show in their hometown of Belo Horizonte, and they play as a three-piece as the bass player couldn't make it. That's Max on the left and Igor on the right. The main act was a Brazilian heavy metal band formed in 1983 called Overdose. Despite it being a 100 capacity venue, only a few kids stuck around to watch this early incarnation of Sepultura. This footage is from an early Sepultura show in 1985. We can see Max with what we now know to be corpse paint, something that was prominent throughout the rise of black metal music. Max first saw this from another Brazilian band called Dorsal Atlantica. When he saw them live as a kid, they came on stage and said, We are Dorsal from Rio. If you don't like us, go f*** yourself and f*** God. 
The classic Sepultura lineup hadn't quite come to fruition yet. That wouldn't happen until around 1987. 1985 would see the release of the first Sepultura EP. It was a split EP with the same band they played their first show with, Overdose. <laughs> In the artwork, you can see the words death metal printed on the paper, along with the titles for some of their first songs, Antichrist, Necromancer, and Warriors of Death, along with some inverted crosses. It was clear what direction Max and Igor wanted this anti-religious and almost satanic band to go in. The EP cover even depicts Satan gripping a church. Max was 16 and Igor was 15. Death metal and black metal were clearly the heavy influences here for early Sepultura, an influence that would shine through on their debut album, Morbid Visions, released in November of 1986 via the independent Brazilian label Cogumela Records. <laughs> For me, it was all over when I first heard Venom, Slayer, Sodom, and Possessed. I needed that aggressive music. I used to go to sleep with Venom's black metal on headphones. That was my going to sleep music, when most people put mellow shit on if they wanted to fall asleep. Me and Igor had a boombox in our room, and we would play Black Metal by Venom and Slayer's Show No Mercy and go to sleep listening to that. The gang mentality looked really appealing to me. I really liked Motorhead in the early days because it looked like they hung out together and did everything together. They were a gang. By their second album, Schizophrenia, released in 1987, Sepultura's sound was starting to come across more polished and more professional in terms of production. <laughs> raw aggressive black metal influence was still very much there, and the classic Sepultura lineup was now in full swing. Max Cavalera, Igor Cavalera, Paolo Jr. and Andreas Kisser would power through the late 80s and early 90s, and Sepultura as a band would produce six albums from 1986 with Morbid Visions up until their 1996 record Roots with Max leading the band. During this era, Sepultura had developed their early black metal sound into what you could consider to be more groove metal territory. You could even argue that they sounded more like an early version of new metal during the early 90s, a genre that often gives credit to Korn as being the original pioneers. I think that was the idea. With Roots, it was about going deep into our Brazilian roots, and that resonated everywhere, including Norwegian black metal, where people went back to their own roots and started incorporating pagan themes. Corn frontman Jonathan Davies would even accuse Sepultura of outright ripping off their sound during the mid-90s. So how did this unique Brazilian thrash death metal outfit transition from a black metal influence to producing one of the most underrated groove and new metal records of the 1990s? And just exactly what happened to Max Cavalera that forced him to quit the band he founded and loved leaving his brother behind. September 1993, Sepultura released their fifth studio album, Chaos AD. It sees the band transition away even further from their thrash and black metal roots, and is considered to be one of the more defining albums of their career. heavily centered in style around groove metal and lyrically a politically charged outlet for Max and the band. Pressure. Yeah. Even everybody thought we have the pressure to do a good album and stuff, you know, because of of our eyes, you know, being so successful. Just three years prior, Pantera released Cowboys from Hell in 1990 often considered to be the first groove metal record and somewhat of a precursor to the downfall of grunge, a genre that had all but died out by the mid-90s thanks to the resurrection of various types of metal music. 
Refuse Resist, a single taken from Chaos AD, would become a fan favourite. And whilst most were simply moshing to this beast in the front row, Sepultura's passion for the topic of the song showed that they were still angry at authority and the state of the current world. At the time, we had a lot of anger, a lot of depression. The world was crazy. That song definitely reflected what we were thinking. We'd seen stuff happening all over the world. Indonesia, China, Brazil, America. We were traveling more and more, and we were learning about all this bullshit that is politics. If you listen to any of the lyrics from this record, you will instantly see how what Sepultura considered to be political injustice drove the aggression behind the album. The band even brought in Jello Biafra to feature on the record. Jello Biafra was the former singer for the notoriously political punk band Dead Kennedys, formed back in 1978, and he held a lot of opinions on the Brazilian government and their treatment of its people. He wrote a song for Sepultura's Chaos AD called Biotech is Godzilla, providing the lyrics for Max to sing. wrote the lyrics about a town in Brazil called Cubatao. He's very smart. When he came down to Brazil, he was talking about all the country's previous presidents, and I hadn't heard of half of them. Nobody I know knows all of Brazil's presidents. He's a total brainiac. Although this was an aggressive outlet for Sepultura, using music to release their built-up anger from the atrocities that they were seeing around the world, it seemed that for one of the members, this aggression was fueling an addiction. An addiction that would almost take the life of Max Cavalera. Max, by his own admission, had always been a heavy drinker. He would claim later in life that he believed the main reason for his heavy drinking was simple. He could never really come to terms with the loss of his father, using alcohol to numb the pain and escape the reality in which his father no longer existed. Whilst touring their 1991 record Arise, he would fully indulge himself in the rock and roll lifestyle, probably thinking it was the normal thing to do. After all, he looked up to the likes of Lemmy, a man that could probably drink Satan under the table if he really wanted to. This addiction, though, was starting to become an issue for Max. I drank half a bottle or a full bottle of vodka every night. It came to a point where it became too much and was starting to affect my normal life. I started doing crazy shit. I went out one afternoon and broke into a friend's house because I knew that he wasn't at home. I drank all the booze that he had there. I passed out in his living room. At some point during this era of Sepultura between 1994 and 1995, Max almost lost his life to another addiction, painkillers. He had started taking them for an old knee injury due to jumping up and down on stage every night. For some reason, he thought it would be a good idea to take a ridiculous amount of Tylenol containing codeine and then went to a bar to start drinking. He ordered one drink and that was almost the end of him. I bought the biggest bottle, which had 200 of them in it, walked out of the pharmacy, stuffed 50 in my mouth and went to the pub to start drinking. The last thing I remember is ordering a rum and coke. After that, everything is black. It was the closest I've been to death. Max luckily woke up in a hospital. Fortunately, his life had not come to an end. However, the life of Sepultura was facing a very different future. The Brazilian jungle isn't exactly the place you'd expect to find a metal band looking for inspiration to record their next album. For Sepultura though, that's exactly what happened. They decided to travel to a small tribal village called Pimental Bobosa in the state of Mato Grosso to visit the Chivante tribe. The Chivante are an indigenous Brazilian tribe that have occupied remote areas of Brazil, most likely for many centuries. 
they lived peaceful and quiet lives, cut off from the rest of Brazil until the 18th century, when the discovery of gold led to the arrival of miners, explorers, settlers and missionaries, causing conflicts with the local indigenous populations. This resulted in thousands of tribe members being slaughtered and some were even enslaved. Sepulchura were relatively unaware that these types of tribes even existed deep in the heart of Brazil when they were younger. Since Chaos AD though, Max had been contemplating visiting these tribes to learn more about them and his own cultural heritage, hence the name of the album Roots. Roots made the earth shake. I closed my eyes and I could picture a hundred thousand people jumping up and down to that tune. The groove was something we were experimenting with because we knew we could always play fast thrash songs if we wanted to. The question was, what else could we do? The concept for the record came from a film called At Play in the Fields of the Lord, with the plot being similar to that of the Chavante tribe's story. A tribe's very existence is threatened by the arrival of outsiders trying to claim the land for themselves and take its natural resources away from the indigenous tribe. Where Max pitched the idea to his wife, the response probably wasn't the one he was expecting. It's important to note that his wife, Gloria, was also Sepultura's manager and had been since around 1989. They married in 1992. She almost had a heart attack. Do you know how much that will cost, she said. You're not Michael Jackson. You don't have an unlimited budget. I kept bugging her and wouldn't let it go. In the end, she said, OK, I'll see what I can do. And in the meantime, you can start finding contacts. <laughs> Max and the band eventually got the all clear from the record label, which at the time was Roadrunner Records, to go and visit the Chavante tribe. They took instruments, were welcomed by the tribe and even recorded some of the album there. The tribal noises and some instruments you hear on Roots were recorded right there in the Brazilian jungle, such as the track Itzari, which includes a traditional Chavante chant. The majority of this record, however, was recorded at Indigo Ranch Studios in California with none other than Ross Robinson a producer that is now commonly known as the godfather of new metal. This is the same producer and studio responsible for Korn's debut record released in 1994 and widely accepted as the first ever new metal album. So it was only natural that Ross Robinson was going to use very similar production techniques on Sepultura's roots compared to his previous work with Korn. Our connection with Ross came from a Fear Factory demo he had recorded a few years before. I was a huge fan of their song Big God because it was so heavy. He had also done a Deftones demo and of course the first Korn album which came out in 94. That album really made an impression on us. We wanted the same raw power with Roots. Roots would be released early in 1996 and would become one of Sepultura's most well-received records. The album landed on charts around the globe, giving them several top 10 positions in multiple countries. This was huge for Sepultura. This was global recognition on a scale nobody saw coming. They were officially the metal gods from Brazil that had conquered the world, something Max and Igor had probably dreamed about from the time they first stepped on stage together. So just exactly why did Max Cavalera leave it all behind? Max and Gloria, Sepultura's manager, had been married for several years by this point. Gloria had a son, Dana Wells, who Max grew very close to. Dana became Max's stepson. Sadly though, for Dana, he would lose his life in a tragic car accident on August 16th, 1996, just a few months following the release of Roots. According to Max and Gloria, a band member's wife had tried to bury Dana as soon as possible so the band could continue touring, without Max or Gloria's permission or knowledge. The wife of a member of Sepultura had called a friend and told that friend that we had asked her to begin the arrangements for Dana's funeral while we were flying home. 
That way, everything would take less time, she said. So the friend called the coroner's office and said she was Dana's sister and that she wanted to collect his body. We feel that this woman did this so that we could come back, basically throw Dana in the ground and go back on tour. Gloria Cavallero. The day after the funeral, certain members of Sepultura were telling Max and Gloria they needed to get back on the tour. Max, on the other hand, was going to suggest the band take a year off, and Gloria's management contract with them was due to end in December of that year. Gloria assumed Max would continue with Sepultura. However, after their European tour was over in 1996, so was Max's time with the band. He decided to quit. The very last show, the classic Sepultura lineup would play together, would be December the 16th, 1996. After the show, the band had given Max an ultimatum. He had to choose Sepultura or his wife. He chose his wife, and the rest of the band told Gloria they didn't want to work with her anymore. Naturally, Max felt very betrayed, and this was the end of Max Cavalera's Sepultura. Of course, they continued with a new singer. However, for many fans, without Max, it just wasn't Sepultura. If you like aliens, UFOs, and the paranormal, check out my brand new channel, The Mulder Mysteries. Click the video link on screen now, or the link in the description, or watch another documentary right here on Raw Music TV.